Hi! In the first video of this series, you might remember, we were training letter embeddings. And the goal was to come up with a decent numeric representation. And let's discuss one particular property. So one thing that I could do is I could say, you know what, let's just one hot encode these letters. So uh, one, zero, 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 zero. And, and this is what we might call a one hot encoding. And these would be arrays that have many zeros and only one one in them. And these had a length of 37 in our example. And that was because we had 26 letters plus 10 numbers uh, plus the space. Now, what we then did is we came up with approaches and algorithms to represent that just slightly differently. Instead of having this giant one hot encoding, we said, well, there's actually some approaches where you end up with different numerical representations. Right? This was the word to vec approach. And I suppose another way of describing this is we could say that these are sparse features, indicating that we have many zeros. Uh, and these features, you could say that these are dense. And the size of these dense features, well, that's a letter K. That's typically something you can give the algorithm. And the thing that we're exploring in this series of videos is what makes these dense embeddings so useful? What, what are some properties that we like there? In this video, I would like to highlight one feature. And that has to do with how we calculate, say, the similarity between, in this case, vector for A and the vector for E. And now there's many ways of calculating this, but there is one feature that's missing in these sparse embeddings. And that is if I were to say, hey, let's calculate the dot product between vector A and uh, vector E. And then I would take this value and multiply it with that one, plus this value multiplied by that one, this one by that one, etc. Then in the sparse encoding, that would always be zero. And again, this is just a measure for similarity, I suppose you could say, but there are some mathematical nuisances here. There are some consequences of this. And there's an algorithm that I wanted to discuss in this video that zooms in on this property. And that algorithm is called GLOVE. So let's zoom in on the idea there. Glove embeddings are word embeddings that are a little bit special in the sense that they don't really use a deep learning algorithm to train them. They are simpler than you might think. Here's the idea behind it. We have two tokens. And each of these two tokens has an embedding that's attached. So some numerical vector. And it's of some dimensionality will take k. And the only thing that we're going to do with these embeddings is we're just gonna determine if they are part of the same context. We're gonna quantify the similarity. So when I have my token TI and it goes through this embedding, well, you can imagine that what I have in here is a numeric vector and I'll just draw a really small one. And I've also got that for the other token. And what I could then do is I could go ahead and calculate the dot product of these two. And what comes out is some number, but this is the, this is the dot product. So let's now pretend that this has to be approximately equal to C of i, j. And, and this is the number of times when token i and token j co-occur. Let's think about what this means. So let's consider a situation when the co-occurrence is high. Well, then probably what has to happen is that the a value as well as the b value, they both have to be strict, strictly larger than zero at the same time in a couple of places. While if the count is low, that is to say equal to zero, well then one way of achieving this is to have a i times b i be approximately zero. So one of these two has to be zero if the other one is big. And there are other ways of achieving this, but by optimizing, 
that is to say, making sure that this is approximately equal, then we might end up with word embeddings that have meaning. And that's the idea behind glove. The idea is not to bother with neural networks in the middle, we're just gonna calculate a dot product of sorts on the embeddings directly and, and, and say that that's a similarity. And it's a similarity that's defined by how often tokens co-occur together. Now, to train this, there's a little bit of pre-processing that we have to do. So let's say that I'll take the same sentence as before. Raza has a really awesome office in Berlin. So what I can do is I can look at all the combinations of words that occur together here. And I can say the context is just being in the same sentence. So then Raza has and Raza a all the way up until in Berlin. So that means that we have these pairs of tokens. So we have token I and token J and they co-occur together. And what I can then do is I can say, well, if we've generated this list, let's now do token I and token J again, but then we also keep track of the counts, right? So we will have to say, well, supposedly Raza and Berlin uh, in the corpus that we have, let's say that the, those two words co-occur 25 times, and maybe we have office and awesome, maybe that occurs a little bit less often, so let's say there's, there's a count of 10, but, but we have to take all of these pairs and get them into some sort of data frame or matrix that has this information. Now, we're not completely ready yet, because if we do this, then we will have counts that are always non-zero. You're only gonna count the items that actually occur together. But if we want to have a good representation here, then it means that we also have to do some negative sampling as it's called. Now, this negative sampling, you can do that in many different ways, but in essence, it boils down to getting pairs of words randomly from all of your sentences. So I could take a random word, let's say dog, and I could take another random word, let's say wrench. And if I take my words at random, then the odds of these two actually occurring together is quite small. And I can say, well, that's a zero. Now there's a few things you can do to help with this sampling. Uh, one thing that you probably wanna be aware of is that you don't sample completely at random because you don't wanna have lots of these negative samples that are just stop tokens like A and N. Yeah, that, that those would be unrepresentative things to learn from. You're not gonna get a good gradient signal out of that. But the idea is that you should perform some form of negative sampling. And you can also play around with how much negative sampling you wanna do. Maybe you wanna have the positive negative samples be 50-50, uh, but there are people who suggest that maybe you wanna have it a little bit more around the 20-80 mark. But whatever you do, just make sure that you're also doing some form of negative sampling. And once you're there with the negative sampling, then typically the command that you would give to the computer is you would say, hey, let's minimize, uh, and let's do this for every example that we have here, right? So that, that's one example. But let's minimize the difference between the dot product, but let's minimize the difference between the dot product of the two vectors uh, and the counts. Well, let's, let's minimize uh, the squared error of that. that. That's the command you would typically give to the, uh, to the algorithm. And you can optimize that with gradient descent, but the idea is that these are the numeric values that you're allowed to change, which in the end will result, once again, in hopefully word embeddings that generalize quite well. So everything that I've explained here is something that I will now implement in Keras and show you. But before I do that, I do want to point out a small difference between what I'll be doing and what the glove paper does. So this is what I'll be doing. That's the formula that I'm optimizing. But the original glove paper is calculating something just slightly different. We're still going to be minimizing and we still have these word embedding vectors. But what we now also have are these bias terms. And these are just numbers attached to every vector that we don't put in the dot product. And then another thing that they do differently is they don't take the counts, but they take the log of the counts. And there's a few reasons why having a log there can be useful. But if you're training on a small data set, which is what I'll be doing, 
then there's not going to be a huge difference. And again, the goal of what I'm doing is to demonstrate intuition. So with that said, I will now implement this in Keras. So here's the Keras model that I wrote to make a glove-like model. There's a few parts that you might recognize if you've seen a previous video. Here, I am using a embedding layer that will receive a token and it will then output a embedding. So this would be the moment where a token would come in, it goes through the embedding layer, and what comes out is a vector for that token. So that could be A1, A2, A3. You know, that, that's a, the k-dimensional vector. And in this particular case, it's three dimensions. Now what I'm doing below is I'm saying, now there's a model that will have two inputs that will be for these two. So that means that I have a token I that can go in and a token J that can go in. Over here, you'll notice that I'm using the embedding that I made above twice. So that means that the architecture will now look like this. And what comes out of these? Well, that is being used by this dot product operator. That is something that I'm explicitly importing from the Keras layers submodule. So that's going into this dot product over here. And then for good measure, I pass that through a ReLU. Because in this case, I think it's fair to say, hey, I only want to have positive count numbers going out of this thing. And then this will be my estimated counts. And th th that's what's going out. And I will be comparing that to the actual counts that are going to go in there. So once again, this is not exactly like a glove, but this is something that is reasonably similar. And I am curious to see what happens if I train my own word embeddings this way. So what I will now do is I will just run this and then share some of the results. So I just ran the glove-like algorithm with a value of k of five. So that's the dimensionality of the embeddings. And what I've done is I've used 20,000 uh, examples. So 20,000 headlines were used. I made all the combinations and, uh, and I've got my results now. But before sharing the results, we should explain a difference with the letter embeddings. So with the letter embeddings, I had a two-dimensional embedding. And you know, we had all the ones and twos and threes and fours in one corner, and, and we had all the vowels and consonants separated. But the thing was, we just had two dimensions to plot. So that was relatively easy. It's really easy to plot something that is two-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane. This is harder when we have embeddings uh, that might have multiple floating point numbers in it. So one thing that I could do is I could say, hey, take that five dimensional array and let's just plot these two. And you wouldn't get the complete picture, but you get a picture. But another thing that we should also mention here is that in the case that you have 37 letters, then you can make a scatter plot that's interpretable. If you're gonna do that for lots and lots of these embeddings, that's gonna get a little bit full. So what I've done is I've just looked at the articles and I've just grabbed a couple of words that I thought should be in a different context. And then I was wondering what the end result might look like. And here's the result. Now, this is not necessarily super easy to interpret. Yeah, we see something of a cluster, but because we're only looking at two dimensions, you could argue we're not really looking at the full picture here. So let's summarize our findings with an alternative way of looking at it. So as an alternative, let's consider the following idea. I'll draw this in two dimensions, but the argument here also holds for higher dimensions. But what I could say, you know, I've got my word one here and I've got my word two here. And these are vectors, right? And in this case, they're two dimensional, but they could be of higher dimensions. And what I can do is I can have a look at the angle between them. People like to call this the cosine distance. The idea here is if the angle is big, then those two word embeddings are probably not similar. And if it's small, then they probably are. And what I can do is I can have a look at the same words that I'm using here, but then look at all the cosine distances between them. And maybe that gives me just a little bit more information. And here are the results. Now, what I've done is I've made a pandas data frame 
and I change the background color. If it's red, that means that those are the higher values, and if it's green, that means that we have lower values of distance. You should also notice that the diagonal mainly contains zeros, so feel free to ignore those, and this is a symmetric matrix. But there's a few things that I at least find are interesting. So we notice a few clusters. This red one, for example, that you also see over here. It seems that we learned that the words arrested and murder and that they don't have too much to do with finance, banks, and wildlife. And then I would argue that that is somewhat sensible. It also seems that violence and arrested, that they have a relationship, which I would also argue is uh, something that's sensible. But these cosine distances aren't the only distance that I can look at. Suppose now, for example, that I've got this one word over here. That's the third word. In this particular case, the cosine distance will be small, but in word embedding space, there's still a bit of distance here. And I might be interested in measuring that. So what I've done is I've also measured this distance. The Euclidean distance. And it's just a different distance measure. So what I'll now do is I'll just have a quick look at those. Hmm. We definitely see that this is giving us a slightly different picture. And in particular, there's one thing that I just don't understand. Uh, arrested and police? and murder and arrested? Why are those values so red? It feels like they should be similar. So, so I hope what's clear is that yes, we can train word embeddings, but figuring out if they are really good, eh, that's, that's tricky business. And a large part of that has to do with the fact that we are dealing here with high dimensional vectors. And no, what I'm doing here should be relatively simple. It's a rather small corpus and this is only five dimensions. Word embeddings, typically, they can have 300. But maybe there's an easy explanation for why we see this. Because I can focus on the algorithm, but maybe the answer is in the data instead. So what I've done is I've looked at all the headlines that I am using, and I'm counting how often I see the word arrested happen. And it turns out the word arrested occurred 56 times. Then what I also did is I counted how often the word murder occurs. That word occurred 172 times. And then I checked how often they occur both in one single headline. It turns out only twice. So it might not be a huge surprise that, yes, I have word embeddings, but they will represent the data set that I'm feeding it. The algorithm doesn't care about language in general because the only thing that it can see is the data set that's in front of it. If there are parts in language that we would expect, then unless this is also clearly in the data as well, then we shouldn't expect a word embedding to actually hold this. And I hope that this final comment on word embeddings makes it clear why it's so hard to train them properly. So with that comes a little bit of advice. If you're training these embeddings to learn more about embeddings in general, that's fine. But if you're gonna apply these word embeddings in practice, it may be a better idea to get a pre-trained word embedding from a third party. A third party who's been able to analyze a general data set and also had the compute power required to do it. Think twice before training your own. You really need a good reason. Note though that pre-trained word embeddings that are trained on large text are also not without issues. They're usually limited by the data that they're trained on. Gender bias is a well-documented issue and there's still a risk of overfitting on a domain. Especially if you're training a digital assistant, then you'd be correct to wonder if text on Wikipedia is going to be representative of what you're going to get in a chat box. In the next video, I will go one step further when it comes to analyzing word embeddings.